And there are two methods we can use ultrasound to guide a paraspinous approach, either a pre-procedural ultrasound-assisted approach or a real-time ultrasound-guided procedure in which you insert the needle under direct vision. We'll look at the pre-procedural ultrasound-assisted approach to start. And this is the approach that I would personally use in difficult patients. I follow a standard ultrasound scanning protocol, which is to start with a parasagittal oblique or PSO view. I identify the various intervertebral levels and mark their position on the skin. At the same time, I also assess the size of the paramedian interlaminar spaces. And this is a qualitative rather than quantitative assessment. My basic rule is if you can see an anterior complex, you have an open interlaminar space. And I consider it a large space partly on the spacing between adjacent laminae and the length of the visible anterior complex, but more so on how easy it is to obtain a view of the anterior complex in terms of how much probe manipulations I have to make. I then identify and mark the midline using the transverse midline view and either mark the intervertebral spaces or if they are not visible, as in obese patients, I mark the spinous processes. I then perform the procedure as I would have done with a landmark guided approach, inserting the needle no more than 0.5 to 1 cm lateral to the spinous process or the midline marked on the skin, and 0.5 to 1 cm cordat to the line that marks the interspace I'm interested in, or if I haven't been able to see the space, then I mark it cranial to the line marking the lower spinous process, as illustrated here. I then insert the needle at a lateral to medial angle of about 10 degrees as discussed. Now I often start at a 5 to 10 degree cranial angle, but you could also choose to start with no cranial angulation, in which case you will inevitably land on lamina and you can then creep up and into the space with redirections. Now, this is not actually how the pre-procedural ultrasound assisted technique is described in most studies in the literature. Using this Korean paper as an example, we see that while most investigators also identify the paramedian intervertebral spaces with a PSO view, they then mark the middle of the short edge of the probe together with the middle of the long edge of the probe where the space is, and then they insert the needle at the intersection of these marks. There are two things to realize about this technique. First, it means that they are often attempting to access the interlaminar space without any cranial angulation of the needle. And this is fine when the space is large, but when the space is narrowed, you may find that the needle tip gets caught up on the lip of the lamina. Remember too, that epidural catheters will feed more easily if the needle is angled cranially, so this may not be an ideal approach for lumbar epidurals. Second, the insertion point is also more lateral with a larger lateral to medial angle. And most investigators will admit that it requires memorizing the angle of probe direction and attempting to mimic that with the needle. This, however, requires more guesswork and estimation and thus is more prone to error. So I believe less experienced practitioners may find it difficult. I certainly do, and for these reasons, I don't do it this way. Nevertheless, this technique of pre-procedural ultrasound scanning and marking has still been shown to be more effective than a pure landmark-guided paramedian approach. Multiple studies have shown this, but I'll highlight just this one from Park and colleagues in Korea. They recruited only patients with either scoliosis or surgery, with the majority of them having scoliosis. All three practitioners were veteran consultant anesthetists with experience in both procedures, and what they found was that ultrasound pre-scanning resulted in fewer skin insertions and needle passes, as well as higher first attempt and first pass success rates. What about a real-time ultrasound-guided paraspinous approach? There's been a lot of work investigating this recently. With regard to thoracic epidurals, a very feasible technique was described first by Park and Gulati in 2018 and further developed by a Korean group who described their technique in detail in a couple of articles shown here. A parasagittal oblique view is again obtained of the thoracic vertebral interspace, with an important point being that the probe is angled slightly to avoid imaging the lower facet joint, which can sometimes present an obstacle to the needle trajectory. It's worth noting that this technique has so far only been described at lower thoracic levels, T9 to 10 or lower, where the spaces are wider than at the higher mid thoracic level. Another important paper is this one by a Chinese group which conducted an RCT that compared real-time ultrasound-guided spinal anesthesia with a pre-procedural ultrasound-assisted approach 
in elderly patients undergoing hip fracture surgery. All procedures were done by one of three experienced anesthesiologists. Now, this group has done quite a lot of work with ultrasound-guided neuraxial blocks, and one of the interesting things about this paper is that they describe and use three different approaches to their real-time ultrasound-guided spinal anesthetics. The first is similar to the real-time thoracic epidural insertion I discussed earlier, in that a PSO view is obtained and the chosen interspace is positioned close to the edge of the screen. The needle is then inserted in plane in a caudal to cranial direction as shown. In the second, the PSO view is again obtained, but this time the chosen interspace is placed in the center of the screen, and then the needle is inserted on the medial side of the probe close to the midline and inserted out of plane with a minimal lateral to medial angle. And this basically mimics the landmark guided paraspinous approach we've been discussing. The third one, which I think is pretty innovative and which they have previously described elsewhere, is to use a transverse view of the interspace and anterior complex. The probe, however, is shifted to bring the edge of that probe close to the midline so that the needle can be inserted in plane at a steep 10 to 15 degrees lateral to medial angle to enter the space, again mimicking the usual angles that we might use with a conventional landmark guided paramedian approach. However, what they observed was that the real-time ultrasound-guided approach was significantly more difficult than the ultrasound-assisted approach. More needle insertion attempts and passes were needed, and the first skin insertion and first pass success rates were significantly lower. It also took a longer time to complete the real-time ultrasound-guided spinal, and the anesthesiologist rated it as a harder technique to perform. Furthermore, In 8 out of 57 or 14% of the real-time ultrasound-guided patients, they were unable to obtain CSF backflow and they had to cross over to the ultrasound-assisted approach, which was subsequently successful. These findings somewhat vindicate my personal opinion about real-time ultrasound-guided spinal anesthesia. I confess that I still struggle to find a place for it in my practice. It's definitely a more complex and complicated procedure and I don't think it's necessary in most patients. In those patients where I really need it, which is mainly those with very narrow spaces or the obese patient with deep spaces, I can't image the spine windows well enough, nor can I image the needle well enough to guide it accurately into place. I think all of us know how difficult it can be to visualize an in-plane needle, especially at large depths and with steep angles. In addition, as I've often said with obese patients, you have to use two hands to control the skin and advance the needle to make it go in a straight line, especially if it's a long needle. Now you could get someone else to hold the probe, but that isn't always feasible. To be fair though, there are studies that support real-time ultrasound-guided neuraxial blocks, including this one, but they are all generally in Asian patient populations where the spectrum of body habitus is perhaps more favorable. For now, I personally find that in my practice, I have the best success with pre-procedural marking and then just focusing on my needle handling and the tactile feedback rather than trying to juggle both probe and needle. 